This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. قضت محكمة البدايات الجزائية اليمنية المتخصصة في قضايا الإرهاب بإعدام عشرة من أتباع الحكومة. A Yemeni penal court that specializes in cases of terrorism sentenced ten Houthi rebels to death and five others to 15 years in jail. Meanwhile, four leaders of the so-called Southern Movement were tried for belonging to an organization that calls itself the Peaceful Struggle of the South. Hamoud Munasar has the details. The defendants reacted to the death penalty and jail terms by repeatedly shouting the slogan of the Houthi group that fought the Yemeni army and security forces in the Sixth War in the provinces of Saada and Amran. These sentences were based on the charges of participation in an armed gang to carry out criminal plans exposing the public to danger. The first defendant, Muhammad Ahmed Hamoud Al Sheikh Al Ugrub. The second defendant, Ahmed Ahmed Muhammad Al Maziji. The third defendant, Abdullah Muhammad Ali Al Utli. The fourth defendant, Abdul Jalil Muhammad Ahmed Hussein Al Gypsy. And the fifth defendant, Bashir Muhammad Ahmed Hussein Al Utli, all received the death penalty. Thirteen convicted men appealed against the legitimacy of the sentences, saying they do not acknowledge the legitimacy of the court. They reject the current government, which they fought against. A lawyer for two defendants appealed the court's decision, which implies that they acknowledge the legitimacy of the court. Meanwhile, the court reiterated that this group is an extension of other groups that the government described as backward forces. We have evidence to prove the accusations of participation in an armed gang in the form of an organized terrorist group that wrongfully justifies its actions on a religious basis with the objective of undermining the country's peace, stability, and national unity. Meanwhile, protests are continuing in some of the southern cities, demanding the release of the arrested men known to be part of the southern movement. Four leaders of the Naja organization were tried on charges of committing criminal acts, undermining national unity, violating constitutional rules, and instigating armed rebellions among people. You say that we call for separation, repeat slogans against unity, and call for the intervention of the international community. The answer, first of all, is that we in the Naja movement have not said these things. Even if we did say these things, the goal was to pressure the authority to respond to the people's requests. As the trials continue against the peaceful struggle of the South, the battles between the government and the armed rebels in Saada and Amran increases the challenges for the Yemeni authorities to restore stability to these areas. أعلن الأمين العام للأمم المتحدة بان كيمون أن تنظيم جولة إعادة في الانتخابات الرئاسية الأفغانية. The United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki Moon stated that organizing runoff elections in Afghanistan will be difficult. The Afghan Election Committee scheduled the runoff election for November 7th after confirming widespread forgery in the first round of elections that took place about two months ago. The Afghan President Hamid Karzai announced his acceptance of the committee's decision and described it as lawful and constitutional. Karzai won less than 50 percent of the vote in the previous election when he ran against former Foreign Minister Abdullah Abdullah, thus making a runoff necessary. Joining us by telephone from Kabul is Abdul Shakur Waqif Hakimi, the media official of the Afghan Islamic Institution and vice president of the election campaign for a candidate, Abdul Abdullah. Welcome, sir. First, what are your thoughts on the election committee's decision to hold another round of elections? What is your official position on this decision? <laughs> We 
In the name of God, the most merciful and compassionate, we welcome this decision. We were waiting for it. We submitted complaints and waited for an investigation. The results will come in the second round of elections. Like I said before, we welcome this decision. Mr. Abdul Shakur, can you guarantee that there will not be more forgery, like in the first round of elections? Is there anything to guarantee that the runoff on November 7th will be different from the previous election? The second round must avoid any mistakes and the problems that happened in the first round of elections. We will provide detailed suggestions to guarantee the integrity and neutrality of the election committee and the ballot centers, so we avoid the problems that we encountered in the first round. What are the institutions and groups that will supervise these elections, or at least the next round of them? Are they the same ones in the first round? Are they confident about the transparency of the next round of elections? We have repeatedly submitted our opinions on the lack of integrity of the election committee, or what is called the Independent Elections Commission in Afghanistan. Like I said, we will provide detailed measures in the next several days so the committee can avoid mistakes it made and problems it caused in the first round, God willing. ضغط على اسلام اباد ياتيها من الداخل والخارج حيث صعدت طهران اليوم من حده اسلام اباد از بينج بريشرد فروم ويزين اند ويزاوت طهران انتنسيفايد اتس اكيوزيشنز توداي اجينست باكستان اوف تيكينج بارت ان ذا اتاك اجينست ذا ايرانيان ريفولوشنري جاردز لاست ساندي ويتش كيلد 15 ممبرز ايرانيان فورن مينستر مناشير موتاكي said that the perpetrators of the attack, which took place in the middle of Iran's southeastern region, are based in Pakistan and received support from intelligence agencies from some countries in the region. According to the Iranian security minister, Sheikh Haider Busalhi, Tehran is supposed to send a security delegation to Pakistan with evidence linking Jundullah with Pakistani intelligence. Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad called on his Pakistani counterpart, Asif Ali Zardari, urging him to arrest Jundullah members, especially after the organization claimed responsibility for the attack in Iran. Ahmadinejad announced previously that his country received information that some Pakistani intelligence agents collaborated with the perpetrators of the attack. He said that Iran has the right to ask for their extradition and said that Tehran will provide evidence linking Pakistan Pakistani intelligence to the explosions and that it will demand Pakistan hand over the head of Jundullah Abdul Malik Rigi. Funeral processions were held for the victims of the attack, which killed 42 and injured 50 others. Our correspondent, Reda al-Basha, reports from Tehran. What message will the Iranian security delegation take to Islamabad since these accusations have intensified? Just as you indicated, the Iranian Minister of Security and the Foreign Minister said that security delegations that will go to Pakistan in the near future will present strong evidence showing that Pakistani intelligence collaborated with Jundallah and supported them inside Pakistan. 
In addition, the Iranian delegation will demand that Pakistan specify a timetable for pursuing Jandallah and hand over the head of this organization, Abdul Malik Rigi, in the near future. Of course, this is the most important message that the Iranian security delegation will present. In addition, Iran has evidence showing that Britain is involved in supporting groups in Sistan and Balochistan, which use bases in Pakistan to attack targets inside Iran. These were the words of Iranian Foreign Minister Manasher Mataki. Rida, how are Iranian security forces dealing with the demonstration that is taking place outside the Saudi embassy in Tehran? Is this demonstration linked to the attack in Iran? There is an intense security presence outside the Saudi embassy in Tehran. All streets leading to the embassy were closed. Iranian students went to the Saudi embassy today to condemn the Saudi policy, which they believe supports terrorist and extremist groups that were behind the attack in Sistan and Balochistan. They are also demanding that the religious ritual of the Hajj be suspended because of the Saudi policy, which these students believe supports Britain and the U.S. They say they do not want to perform the Hajj in a country that serves American interests. Are there new arrests? According to an Iranian official last night, the identity of the perpetrator was revealed. He said that Iran could not arrest the ones who helped him carry out this operation. It is believed that they left Iran and went to Pakistan. Thank you, Reda Al-Basha, who joined us from Tehran. Three suspects have been arrested in connection with Sunday's deadly bombing in Iran's Sistan, Baluchistan province. The public prosecutor of the provincial capital, Zahidan, says the bomber, who has also been identified as an Iranian national. The prosecutor did not give more information as the case is in the process of being investigated. Meanwhile, a funeral for eight of the attack victims was held in the capital, Tehran. Thousands of people, including high-ranking officials, took part in the funeral procession. The bodies of most of the victims were already laid to rest in their hometowns in the southeastern part of the country. The terrorist act killed 42 people, including several senior commanders of the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps. Remaining with the issue, Iran is sending a group of security and intelligence officers to Pakistan. The delegation will discuss the recent terrorist attack against Iran with Islamabad officials. Tehran says the group behind Sunday's deadly bombing in the country's southeast is based in Pakistan. The intelligence minister says Tehran has evidence that the leader of the group, known as Jundullah, has links with Pakistan's intelligence agencies. Jundullah has claimed responsibility for Sunday's bombing. Pakistan's foreign ministry spokesman Abdul Basit told Press TV on Sunday that the attack was an attempt to, quote, spoil ties with Tehran. He said Islamabad would do its best to capture and hand over the anti-Iran terrorists to Iranian authorities. Hundreds of Iranian students have gathered in front of the Saudi embassy in Tehran to protest the Saudi policies towards Muslims. The students accuse the Saudi government of involvement in the killing of Muslims in other countries, as well as disrupting the process of Shia-Sunni unification. The protesters say the Saudis are behind recent unrest in Yemen and Iraq. Police surrounded the area and prevented the demonstrators from moving toward the embassy.
Iraq's Minister of State for National Security Sherwan Awa'ali said that 30 members of the Kurdistan Workers' Party, PKK, are seeking to return to their country, Turkey. During an interview with al Iraqiya channel, Awa'ali said that the negotiations with Ankara will continue around the evacuation of more than 13,000 Turkish nationals from the Makmur refugee camp. As part of the efforts underway in the Iraqi Kurdistan region, several members from the PKK were allowed to travel between the region and Turkey. They returned to Turkey via the Ibrahim al Khali border crossing point, also known as the Sharnak Passage on the Turkish side. Today, 30 members from the PKK tried to cross into Turkey, but only a few of them were allowed to enter. Currently, we're negotiating with Turkey in order to secure a safe passage for them to Ankara. We're seeking to help secure the return of more than 13,000 Turkish nationals in the Mahmur camp. We're trying to find a peaceful closure to the PKK issue by allowing all members to return safely to their country. The countless crimes committed by members of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party are familiar to nearly everyone except for those in denial. A senior member of the Ba'ath Party gave confessions today before the Iraqi High Criminal Court. Kutban Ibrahim al-Hassan admitted today before the Iraqi High Criminal Court that the dismantled Ba'ath Party has committed countless crimes against the Iraqi people. The Iraqi High Criminal Court held another trial session today against members of the former Iraqi regime. The defendants are standing trial on charges stemming from their role in draining Iraq's marsh region and displacing its residents in the 1980s. I was displaced by Saddam. This is my third day on the run. They wiped out entire families, including children. We were left with nothing. We had no place to hide. They followed us everywhere. Where is the international community and where are the good people of Iraq? We were displaced by Saddam. He didn't leave us alone. The court listened to recorded testimonies from a number of witnesses, including Qutban Ibrahim al-Hassan. Al-Hassan admitted that several members of the dismantled Iraqi Ba'ath Party have committed countless crimes against the Iraqi people and called for their prosecution. The leaders of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party must be prosecuted. Its leaders must be held accountable for political and criminal charges. They must be held politically accountable for the crimes they committed and the harm they caused to the nation. I, for one, demand their prosecution. The Iraqi High Criminal Court held its 27th trial session with the Honorable Judge Mahmoud Sali al-Hassan presiding. Thirty-three senior members from the dismantled Ba'ath Party, which ruled Iraq with an iron fist, are standing trial. Among the defendants are Ali Hassan al-Majid, also known as Chemical Ali, Abed Hamid and Tariq Aziz. The presiding judge has adjourned today's court session until Tuesday. The Islamic Party said the Somali president's call to opposition parties for dialogue was hypocritical. The party added that it will not carry out any dialogue with the government because it is part of the problem in Somalia. The Islamic Party spokesman said that the government of Sharif Sheikh Ahmad is participating in what he called a crime against the Somali people committed by the African Union forces. The Somali government views the latest battles between the Islamic Party and the Al-Shabaab Al-Mujahideen movement as an opportunity to show that the ongoing war in the country is not based on religion. The Somali president demanded that the fighting between Somalis be stopped, even between his opposition parties, and called on them to hold dialogue with the interim government and find diplomatic ways to solve their problems. We are sorry for the war that is taking place in southern Somalia between our opponents who at one point described us as infidels. This war shows that their ideas are not sound. 
We are calling on them to stop fighting. If they are trying to achieve certain objectives, then the government is ready to open dialogue with all parties in order to end problems in the country. However, this call fell on deaf ears. The Islamic Party reiterated its previous conditions with the government, including the demand for Ethiopian forces to leave the country, dissolve the current government, and hold a general conference for dialogue and reconciliation between all Somali people. Sharif was the leader of two popular intifadas. The first one was launched against warlords. The second was launched against the Ethiopian invasion. However, the developments that followed these two popular intifadas should have been used to solve the political crisis in Somalia. Instead, the situation returned to square one and the president became the Karzai of Somalia. Political observers believe that Somali reconciliation requires tangible compromises, especially from the opposition and the interim government as well. The preconditions set for the dialogue will weaken the possibility of bridging the gap between political opponents in the country, especially between the Islamic Party and the interim government. The Al Shabab Al Mujahideen movement looks at things from an ideological perspective and believes the current government is not Islamic. No one is allowed to talk about it. The only solution, in their view, is fighting the interim government and defeating it with military force. This reflects the international community's symbolic support of the Somali president, especially support from the United States and neighboring countries. We open with a spy scandal in Washington. An American scientist who thought he was working for Israel is under arrest for espionage. Justice Department officials say that Stuart Nozet sold information to an FBI man posing as a Mossad agent. Israel is not suspected of involvement. IBA Sarah Levine has been following developments. A shocking arrest in this normally quiet Maryland suburb. Top American scientist Stuart David Nozet, who had extensive knowledge of highly classified government information, was arrested by federal authorities. He was charged with attempting to sell top secret information to an FBI operative who was posing as an Israeli intelligence agent. Nozet is credited with helping to discover the evidence of water on the moon and worked for several top scientific government agencies over the past three decades, including NASA, the Energy Department, and the National Space Council and the President's Office. He was granted top security clearances and access to classified defense information relating to atomic and nuclear materials. According to the Justice Department, from 1998 to 2008, Nozet worked as an outside technical advisor for an Israeli consultant firm, for which he was paid $225,000. It is now reported that the American scientist had business dealings with Israel Aerospace Industries, Israel's largest exporter of defense and aerospace technology. The IAI has refused to comment, except to say they are checking into the matter. On September 3rd, an undercover FBI officer contacted Nozet, purporting to be an Israeli Mossad agent. The two met at a Washington hotel soon after, and Nozet allegedly expressed his willingness to work for Israeli intelligence in return for large cash sums. According to the affidavit, Nozet told the agent that he no longer had legal access to classified information, but that he could recall it by memory. The agent told Nozet that the Mossad would set up a communication system for the two to exchange information and money payments. Over the course of the next few weeks, according to court papers, the FBI left Nozet letters in the post office mailbox requesting classified satellite information. The scientists allegedly answered them and received cash payments in return. Nozet was arrested yesterday and formally charged in a criminal complaint with attempting to communicate, deliver and transmit classified information. He is expected to make his first court appearance today. Stunned neighbors expressed their shock as they watched the FBI search Nozet's house, carrying out bags and information. 
Court papers do not mention any involvement by the Israeli government, and Jerusalem has no initial comment. This is Sarah Levine for IBA News. The heat wave that has swept over Lebanon has caused more fires, including a large fire in the region of Tikrit and Akkar. Lebanese military forces are trying to put out the fire. The heat wave caused fires in Akkar, ravaging many almond and olive trees. A large fire broke out in the valley between the two towns of Tikrit and Rahvi and burned a wide range of farms with olive, grape, pine and other types of trees. Military forces worked on putting out the fire. Every other day there is a fire. We don't know the exact cause of it. It could be climate factors like the air or the sun. But the problem is that we don't get good responses from the fire department. It is necessary to improve the capability of our fire departments and civil defense forces. They must be more prepared. Do you think that the fire will be controlled soon? It is possible if there were more equipment and manpower, then of course it would help to contain the fire immediately. But I feel that the fire is more powerful than the manpower we have and the equipment is not sufficient. The olive trees are the most important in this area, which is mainly comprised of olive groves and farmland. This is a big loss, but we leave it to God. When the residents, military forces and civil defense volunteers rushed to put out the flames, the problem of poor equipment became evident, especially considering that the location of the fire was difficult to reach, thus delaying the process of containment. Today's fire is one of a series of fires that swept through the whole Akkar region. There is a serious attempt to extinguish the fire in the town of Tikrit. Lebanese firefighters consisting of the internal security forces, residents of the town and civil defense volunteers are trying to control the fire. The Lebanese Air Force is also participating in putting out the fire. In the Ikhlim al Harub region, a similar heat wave is the reason for the rise in temperature. The residents escape to the sea to get away from the heat. The heat wave sparked off fires in the Iqlim al Kharab region of Lebanon. Flames broke out in fields of olive, carob trees and pine trees, as well as some forested areas, especially in the Al-Almen area by the northern bank of the Al-Awali River, where a massive fire broke out and burned some fruit trees. In the areas of Basir and Barja, the fire crews subordinate to the civil defense forces managed to put out some of the fires. They are still working to contain the fire to prevent it from spreading. The October heat sparked by mountain fires drove some citizens living by the beach to the ocean. At the beaches, many swimmers headed to the waters to cool off. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic Video Podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.